good morning, everybody. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Um, my name is Christian. I'm one of the, the pastors here at Expectation Church. I'm excited that you guys came to, to join us today. Um, yeah, so uh, we started a new series last week. Uh, it's on human sexuality. And so uh, there's a few uh, disclaimers, a few things that I need to say up front. Last week we, we spoke, I say we, it, it really was a we. It was, it was a we. We spoke. Uh, I spoke on the, the topic of homosexuality and what does the Bible have to say. And um, it was fun. And we, we opened up the floor for, for questions that you could text questions in. And we had over 50 questions come in and in my inbox this week. Uh, and really, if I could, I really didn't have very much, if any, negative pushback from last week. Uh, a lot of very positive and encouraging. So thank you so much uh, for the encouragement. But there was also a lot of questions. And I did have some back and forth in email. And some people I just said, hey, my, my inbox is full. I will get back to you. I, I promise. So I, I put names on a to-do list uh, for me to follow up on. And so there is a, a, because of the topic of the nature of what we're talking about, uh, I will say that if you have your kids in here with you for service, you are more than welcome to have them in here with you. You just may have to address some topics of conversation after today. Uh, and you may have to, so it, it, we have an excellent, amazing kids program. Uh, it's called eKids. You're welcome to, if, you know, if you don't want to engage in that topic of conversation just yet, you can take your kids over uh, to eKids. And today what we're going to look at is uh, heterosexuality. So last week was homosexuality. Today I'm going to talk about heterosexuality. And there's some real difficult things that we need to navigate. Um, and, but before I, I get into it, and I, I generally don't respond to stuff that happens on social media, but this has come up a few times, so I'm going to address it really quickly. Um, my wristbands. Uh, this is, I'm not wearing rainbow wristbands for pride or anything like that, okay? Um, this, so each one has, a, has different significance to me. I'm, I'm uh, like a... a, a uh, gifts kind of guy. That's how, I if you ever want to show me appreciation, I like stuff. And I know that makes me sound terrible, but that's me. And so, like, this wristband is a friendship bracelet. When I was in Virginia Beach on vacation last summer, uh, I got to spend, like, half a day with my son, just him and me, at a, we, it was one of those cheesy arcade places where you get a bunch of tickets, and, uh, you know, after 4,000 tickets, we could afford two friendship bracelets. Um, and I don't know if that's what it was. It was something crazy like that. And so we each wanted to get one. He doesn't wear his anymore. Um, but I still wear mine because it, it, it means something to me. Um, this gray one right here is for our, our e-students ministry, our, our ministry for 6th through 12th graders. Uh, I have two kids that are in that ministry. Um, so this is significant to me. Um, this green one right here is for uh, the Feed Fairfax 5K. That's, it's a big race that uh, our church supports every year. Um, where we help provide for the needs of food insecure kids in our county. Um, and then this, this yellow one right here, we had a young man in our church uh, uh, some time ago. His name was Rajay, and uh, Rajay had cancer. Um, cancer ended up taking his, his leg. He graduated high school, started school at, at George Mason, and then cancer ended up taking his life. Um, and he had these yellow wristbands that he would give out to remind people to pray for him, and it says on the wristband, faith is the cure, um, which so... I, I still wear that today. And then this red one is a wristband for Expectation Church. But all of these, just, when I look at them, they have significance to me. Um, sometimes they trigger me to, to pray for things. And really, it, even if they were the rainbow, real quick, the rainbow is a symbol and has, has always been a symbol, a sign of God's covenant promise to humanity. So throughout the ages, it's meant different things. And uh, if you're an 80s, 90s person, the rainbow's like had a significant meaning for Lisa Frank. If you don't know what Lisa Frank is, then you're not an 80s or 90s person. That's okay. Um, and now, you know, the rainbow is, is, is being applied to, to the LGBTQ community and, the, you know, they call it the pride flag. I don't care what humanity tries to, to make it mean to humanity. The rainbow is always a sign of God's covenant promise to humanity. So that's what the rainbow is. So anyway, that's my bracelets. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to make some political statement, okay, or, or any other. I'm just wearing bracelets. So today, um, heterosexuality, and I'll just... Yeah, so I'm going to start today with three, hopefully, very clear statements. Uh, last week, 
And if you submitted a question last week, so that, that reminds me, another thing I need to do is I'm going to put them up on the, we'll put them up on the screens right now. We did this last week. Um, if you would like to ask a question based on what we're talking about today, and this is where I said we spoke, because last week we had over 50 questions come, on, come in on this thing. Um, no way I'm going to be able to get to them all, but I'm going to try. So if you'd like to ask a question, just pull your phone out. You don't have to download anything. You just scan that QR code or go to that website and put in that code. And then you can text a question in. And then maybe if, if, you go, if you do this, you might find somebody's question that you want to have asked. You can upvote that, that question. And so this week what I've started doing is I'm, I'm just sitting at my desk recording like a 20-minute video and going through all the questions that have come in. I'll be posting those on my YouTube channel um, so that way you can, hopefully I'll get to the questions that, that you have asked because I don't want to just leave you hanging on that. And there was so many questions and today there's going to be so many questions and the feedback that I got from last week's message uh, on homosexuality, it was very conflicting for me because some people were like very encouraging, like that was one of the clearest messages on this topic that I've ever heard. Thank you for being so clear. I really appreciate you bringing clarity to this. And then other people were saying, you were so ambiguous. I'm so confused about what you said. I don't know what you were saying. And here I am going, cool. Like, what do I do? So it does, this is a conversation that, that needs to happen. It's also something that you need to dig into on your own time. And we put some resources out. Uh, I, I shared the resources that I use to prepare the message um, so you need to dig into it and really, I would say, wrestle with the Lord uh, about what he wants. And really, that's what it needs to come down to. May we always surrender our own thoughts, opinions, ideas. May we always surrender that to God and his design. So with that, I'm going to start today with um, three, hopefully, very clear statements. Very clear statements. And then I'm going to go into the scriptures and we're going to see where these statements come from in the text. All right? So statement number one. God's design for joining a man with a woman is for two to become one for life. That's okay. God's design for joining a man with a woman is for two to become one for life. All right, that's statement number one. Statement number two. Marriage is God's design joining a man with a woman. So if you want to, you know, apply some logic and put those two statements together, you could say that, that I, I, the first statement was God's design for joining a man with a woman is two to become one for life, which means marriage is two becoming one for life. That's what it is. And that's God's design for joining a man and a woman. All right, now the statement number three. Sex is the physical demonstration of God's design for joining a man with a woman. Put another way to, you know, insert. <laughs> Sex is the physical demonstration of marriage. All right, three, hopefully that, that, like, that's clear, right? Okay, well, it's clear to two people, which I'll, I'll take, right? It's, it's, it's clear. When we talk about sex, and we talk about marriage, when we're coming at it from a, a biblical frame of reference, you, you cannot really, you should not delineate the two. And you also have to include a conversation about God's design. And we could see this. This is what Jesus did. Now, the, the scriptures that I'm going to go through today, are they're going like, to hit home, okay? It's going to get real uncomfortable in here. Like, take some of the positives. It may be uncomfortable for you sitting there, but one of the positives is you don't have to be the person on the stage saying it. So take the positives where you can get them. It's going to get real uncomfortable. It's going to get very real in here. So one of the things I want you to hear in this is please, please don't, I'm not trying to, you know, come across as judging. I'm not trying to beat anybody over the head with the Bible. It's not my intent at all. I just, like I said, I just want to, to, to follow Christ in everything. And let's look at what Jesus actually taught about really where these, these, these three statements, they come from Christ and God's word. So the first place we're going to go is Matthew chapter 5. This is what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. 
And what Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount, he actually kind of goes through the Ten Commandments. He kind of uses that as an outline or a reference point. He goes through the Old Testament, and he doesn't really, it's not that he changes what God has said. It's more like he realigns these people. Because when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, he was with his disciples, he was with lots of crowds, and he was with religious leaders. And so he's realigning our understanding to God's word and God's truth, which has not changed. We've just kind of gotten it wrong over the years. And so he's, he's going through this realignment message. And so here he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, which is one of the Ten Commandments. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In Jesus' culture, in Jesus' day and age, adultery was not considered from a, a viewpoint, a lens of purity. Adultery was considered from a, a stance of theft. Adultery was to steal another man's wife. That's what adultery was. It was theft. And Jesus is saying, look, it's not about theft. This is about purity of heart. And so I tell you that even if you would look upon a woman lustfully, and that with that word to, to look upon a woman lustfully, what it means is to, to plan, to scheme, to come up with a way to engage in sexual activity with that person. If you look upon a woman lustfully, then you've already committed adultery. Okay? Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you, for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It's very quiet, right? Like, people like to, to, to have this idea that, you know, Jesus was all about love, and Jesus, he was, yes, he was all about love, 100%, but don't tell me that Jesus didn't teach some hard stuff. Because Jesus is talking about bodies being thrown into hell right here, and this is Jesus. So when you have this whole idea like, yeah, Jesus is my homeboy, I'm cool with Jesus, you need to understand the Jesus that you're talking about. Okay, he, was, he, he taught some very difficult things. And if your right hand causes you to stumble... Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose, so he repeats himself, one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. All right? Now, right there, we could, we could hit the pause button, and this is already going to be a pretty heavy message. But Jesus didn't hit the pause button. He kept going. We go to verses 31 and 32. It has been said, Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, that word is porneia in the Greek, it's where we get the word for pornography, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now let's preach. Like that's some heavy stuff, right? United States of America, just south of 50% of all marriages into divorce. So I know I'm talking to people in here right now. And I know this is going to be heavy hitting. And I know this is going to be difficult. So please understand, like, I, I love you and I want you here. But we're going to address, we're going to look at some of the things that Jesus said. And if this wasn't enough, Jesus actually preaches about this same topic again in another place. So right now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 19. And I'm going to keep reading some more scripture some Pharisees, they came to Jesus to test him. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So what's going on right now? And Jesus already referred to this in Matthew chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, uh, verses 1 through 4, it's a very short little uh, section of scripture, but there's instruction given about divorce. And it says that, that uh, if, a man that if a man divorces his wife he, and he writes her, and the way it's written in the Hebrews, if, or, or when a man divorces his wife and he writes her a, a certificate of divorce, the command in the scripture is not to write her a certificate of divorce. That was a cultural thing that was happening. And what Moses says is when that happens, when that happens, if a woman divorces her husband and then goes out and remarries because the certificate of divorce says that you have the right to marry anyone you want, and that marriage ends for some reason. She can't go back and remarry the previous husband. That's what it says in the Old Testament. That's what the, the passage of Scripture is all about. But what the Pharisees, the religious leaders were doing in Jesus' time is they like to really just dig into the text and really split hairs. And one of the debates that had, had been born out of this text, there was kind of two schools of thought. One was from a guy, a leader named Hillel, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. And 
what he interpreted and what he taught is because in Deuteronomy 24, it says that, that uh, a man will write a certificate of divorce. He writes a certificate of divorce because he finds something displeasing in his wife. So what does that actually mean to find something displeasing? Well, Hillel taught, like, it could be anything displeasing. Like, sure, if, if, if she commits adultery, that's displeasing. But man, if, if she makes some, like, a really bad meal one night... That's displeasing. And I'm not, that's not exaggeration. That's one of the teachings of Hillel. If a man saw another woman and he found that woman more pleasing than his wife, then his wife just became displeasing and he could write her a certificate of divorce. So on the other side of the spectrum, there's another guy named Shemai, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name as well, but he taught, no, 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 no. To be displeasing, that implies only, only sexual immorality. And so that, that's the only time that a certificate of divorce can be written. So there was this debate between the two. Uh, is, it, is it Hillel's school of thought? And that was really the cultural norm during Jesus' age. Is it was for any and every reason. If you can find a reason that your wife is displeasing, displeasing to you. Now, husbands, is your wife ever displeasing to you? The answer is no. Okay? I answered that quickly for you. You're welcome. Okay? The answer is no. She's perfect in all ways. So there you go. But if, if that were to ever occur, so that was the, the, the culture that Jesus lived in, that if a, if a woman was found to be displeasing, and she had no re recourse, so if a woman found a man displeasing, tough. That's the culture that Jesus lived in. And so Jesus is speaking to this debate, and he actually kind of goes beyond the debate. He transcends the debate between these two schools of thoughts, between Hillel and Shammai. And what Jesus says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, this is where we go back to the creation story. Jesus is going back to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. At the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. A man leaves his family to unite God's design for joining a man and a woman is for two to become one. Unite and two will become one flesh. Keep going, verse six, and he repeats himself. So the, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus, which side of the argument's right? Is it this side or that side? And Jesus said, let's go back to the original design. Let's stop worrying about which way is the right way out of this thing and start realizing that God doesn't want there to be a way out of this thing. That the original design was for two to become one for life. Let no one separate. And so they asked him, well, then why is there Deuteronomy chapter 24? Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, one, that wasn't Moses' command. Moses was giving, a, he, he, he permitted you to divorce. There was a concession there. Why? Because you guys were messing the whole thing up. Because of your hard hearts. But it was not this way from the beginning. It's not what God has designed for joining a man and a woman. He's almost done. I wish he was, but he's not. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, there's that word porneia again, and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. Now what the, the disciples, they're being snarky with this. They're being little, like what they're saying is, look, man, if there's no escape, I mean, why lock yourself into something that's supposed to be lifelong? If this is the situation, if this is the way it's supposed to be, then why even get married? And so they're making this joke. They're making light of it. And Jesus, he's actually deadly serious about this. He doesn't make light of it. He actually takes what they just said, it's better not to marry, and speaks to this in all seriousness. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, this whole idea that it's better not to marry, but only those for whom it has been given. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 7, which I'm going to get to in this series as well. For there are eunuchs. Now, if you don't know what a eunuch is, a eunuch is a person, uh, a male, who for whatever reason, and Jesus talks about the reasons, uh, cannot bear children. Uh, they, maybe they were born this way. There are eunuchs who were born that way. And there are eunuchs who have been made that way. 
Sometimes uh, if there was a, a high-ranking woman that had male servants, the males would be uh, emasculated or castrated so that they were, there was no danger of them violating their, their female mistress, the, the person that they served. And so they were made that way in slavery. So Jesus is using, even in, in Jesus' culture and day and age, like you, the whole idea of a, a eunuch was something, it was, it was extreme. It was very radical, the language that he's using. And there are those, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Like what Jesus just said right now is revolutionary, especially in his culture and his context. In Jesus' culture and context, like, men, you were supposed to get married. If you didn't get married, there was something wrong with you. Women, you were supposed to get married. If you didn't get married, there was something wrong with you. And Jesus is actually saying, no, it's okay to be single for the Lord. He's like, this is, this is revolutionary. This is new. And he's changing things, and he's saying those who can't accept this, they should accept it. So one of the, the next week in this series, we're going to talk about gender. Okay, and then the week after, we're going to talk about singleness because I don't think that gets talked about enough, especially in the church today. Sometimes I think we elevate marriage to be this super high and holy thing, and Jesus actually completely validates not only marriage, but he validates singleness in this, in this moment, in this teaching. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 7, so we're going to talk about singleness as well, and we may even return to this passage. Now, there is so much here, and I know you probably have lots of questions right now, and I wish I could say, all right, now let's get into it. Let's start looking at these things, but I'm not done. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, starting at verse 12. Now, Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, a church that was very deeply rooted in, in Greek culture and in Greek thought. And so one of the things that, that was very prevalent in Greek philosophy is that the body is a, is, a, is a natural, it's an earthly vessel. That's all it is. And so there are natural functions of the body, like eating. And you say, I'm allowed to do anything. Like, it's, it's natural, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. Like, just as like I can, the food was designed for me to eat. And I was designed to eat. And so since food is for the stomach and stomach for the food, we should be able to eat whatever we want because it's just, it's just a natural function of the body. Sex is just a natural function of the body. I should be able to, to enjoy sex however I want because it's just a natural function of the body. And Paul is saying, no, no. You, you can say you're allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even if you're allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food, and this is true, but someday God will do away with both of them. Yeah, we live in a natural body, but God's going to take this natural body and he's going to turn it into a supernatural body someday. That's what he's going to teach just three more chapters later and four more chapters later in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's going to, or sorry, I did bad math. He's going to change this body. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. Your translation might say, our bodies were made for the Lord and the Lord for our body. But that's what he's talking about, is the Lord is for our bodies, for these vessels, for these things that he has created, that he has designed, that he has made. The Lord cares about our bodies. He's going to change these bodies for those who are in Christ and the supernatural bodies at the resurrection. All right, let's keep going. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. So don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute, for example? Never! Don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? Well, I, yeah, but it's a natural function. No, we remember I'm going off of what Jesus taught about sex. I'm going off of what God, I believe, teaches about sex. Sex is the physical demonstration of God's design for joining a man and a woman. That's, that's, that's how God has designed it. And so if, if a man who is a, a part of Christ, he has been spiritually united with Christ, if he goes and 
he participates in sex. Say with a, a prostitute, what he's doing is it's uh, one of the words I came across when I was studying. I really liked it. It's a, it's a hyphenated word. Physical, spiritual. Sex is physical, spiritual. Sex, yes, it's physical, but there's also a spiritual component to it. So how can we, who have been united with Christ, who have been joined with Christ to be one with Christ, how can we also unite and join with that which is sinful? Sexual immorality. For the scriptures say the two are united into one. Sex is a physical demonstration of marriage. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. We've been spiritually joined with Christ. For this reason, run from sexual sin. I l- we do this so much. We, 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 we like to, especially, I remember teaching this as a youth pastor all the time because one of the most common questions that teenagers ask, which adults don't ask because they just like to decide for themselves, but you're still wondering, is how far is too far? Like, where's the line? How much can I do with my girlfriend? Like, is holding hands sin? No, okay, cool. Is kissing sin? No, okay, cool. Is, is French kissing sin? No, okay, cool. And they start asking, like, where's the line where too far is too far? Like, where's that line? How close can I get? And what the Bible teaches is quit worrying about the line and where the line's at. You shouldn't be trying to get to the line. You should be running away from it. Run away from sexual immorality. Flee from sexual immorality. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. And you might say, well, drinking affects the body and and hurting other people affects the body. But there's something physical, spiritual about sex that we join our bodies with another and the two become one. And so it, there's, it's, there's nothing, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this, as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. The same body that God is for. The same body that he purchased to redeem you. Verse 19, he's not done. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, and that price is the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He has purchased us from slavery to sin so that we might become slaves unto him. And I know that sounds like going from one slavery to another, but here's the paradox about slavery to Christ. To be a slave to Christ is to be free. It is for freedom that you have been set free, the scripture says. To be free in Christ is to be free indeed, the scripture says. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. All right. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. That's where I got the 12 from. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one slide up on the screen. I'm going to leave it there for a while. And I'm going to talk through this because there were some very heavy hitting things. There were some, some very real things that Jesus said and that Paul said. Deal radically with causes. Jesus said if, you're, if your right arm causes you to stumble, cut it off. Now, I don't think that Jesus was literally asking for his disciples, his followers, to maim themselves and to dismember themselves. If your right eye causes you to sin, that's the, you know, if you look at a woman lustfully, if your right eye causes you to sin, Gouge it. I don't think he was advocating for people to actually gouge their eyes out. Why? Because if we look in antiquity, we look at the Peter, for example, who denied Christ. Peter didn't cut his tongue out. It's not about uh, uh, severing actual body parts, but it is about dealing radical with that which causes us to stumble. The thing that, and what Jesus is talking about was stumble from what? Jesus is saying, if there's anything that gets in the way of God's will for you, if there's anything that gets in the way of God's plan of salvation, if there's anything that gets in the way of God's design, Cut it off. Radically deal with it. Now you might be saying, well, okay, all right, well that sounds a little extreme. It is extreme. That's hence the word radical. So how does this apply, especially the the text and the scriptures that we read through? Well, Jesus talked about lusting in your heart. We're talking about heterosexuality today. So one of the things that has to enter into the conversation is pornography. I've, I've even heard of pastors saying, you know, we, we, we can, we, my wife and I use pornography in a beneficial way where it, it helps keep the, the spice in our physical relationship. No, no and no again. All it is doing is inviting lust and sin into your life. That's it. And Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, if your right eye causes you to lust, gouge it out. You, you cut pornography out of your life. So what's an extreme? Well, Christian, what does that mean? Like if you can't have a computer in your house without looking at your porn, then get rid of your computer. 
Well, I might lose my job. Cut your arm off. What sounds more radical? I know that sounds harsh, but the things that are causing you to not live according to God's design, cut them off. Now, again, I'm not advocating for you to physically maim yourself. I'm pretty sure the person that sins with their right arm can sin with their left as well. I'm not calling you to physically maim yourself, but the things in your life. So pornography enters into the conversation because Jesus called it out when he said that to, to look upon another woman with lust in your heart, to be thinking about engaging in sex with that person, that's adultery. Don't do it. And then he, he talks about divorce. Then he starts getting, especially in our context today, it starts getting really real. So what does that, how does that apply? What is, how does that work? And what Jesus is saying, so a lot of people, what they do is they look at what Jesus said in Matthew and they also compare it to what he said in Mark and Luke where he taught the same thing. But in Matthew, he says, except in the case of sexual immorality. Except in that case. So some people, what we like to do is we like to look at what Jesus taught and we like to think, okay, so there's an exceptional clause just because Jesus never mentioned the exception in Mark and Luke doesn't change the truth of what he was saying. We shouldn't be looking to the scriptures trying to find a loophole, trying to find permission to get away from God's design. What Jesus taught is God's design. We need to go back to what God has designed. And what he has designed for joining a man and a woman together is called marriage. And what marriage is is for a man and a woman to become one for life. And for when a, when a person engages in sexual immorality, in pornea, what they do is they take this, this joining, which sex is a physical demonstration of that joining, they take that physical demonstration and they apply it to someone else. And in applying it to someone else, what they're doing is tearing apart what God has joined together. This is why Jesus said, let no one tear apart what God has joined together because that was his design. And so what Jesus teaches is, yes, there are cases, because we are sinners and we are broken people, that we may tear apart what God has joined together. And should that happen, then the marriage in God's eyes is dissolved and it is broken. So yes, I do think that you can remarry. I do think that that can happen after a tearing apart like that has occurred. But we shouldn't be looking for ways that we can tear it apart. I once counseled a, a couple that was really going through a mess, and the woman literally committed adultery so that way she could be true to scripture. She thought, well, if I commit adultery, then we have permission to end the marriage. That's not God's design. God doesn't want you to go out and commit adultery. So what about the, what about the, what if we got divorced? See, you, you start doing the what ifs. I get it, because my brain does that too. What if we got divorced because he's just a terrible human being and she's awful. We just can't get along anymore, and it's not good for us to be together, and so we're divorced. There was never any sexual immorality, but, but we're divorced. We're separated right now. The, the marriage has been broken. All right, this is where it gets real. I'm going to sit down for this like I sat down last service because it makes me a little... Then in God's eyes, if that sexual immorality has not occurred, in God's eyes, the two are not torn asunder. The two are still one. And God can, through his power and his grace, he can bring reconciliation and restoration. I've seen it happen. It can happen. But even if there's not going to be reconciliation between the couple, Jesus says that to go out and marry another, that's also committing adultery. That's sin. So what do we do? What do we do with that? Last week, I stood on the stage and very passionately said that a homosexual person should surrender their sexuality over to Jesus and follow him in the way that he wants them to live. Now that may mean celibacy. Well, if that's what Jesus is calling of us, then we should follow in those footsteps because homosexual sex is a sin. Just like what Jesus talked about, adultery is a sin. And there is no way that I'm gonna stand up here or sit and say that a homosexual should deny their sexuality and surrender that over to Jesus Christ and follow him. There's no way I'm gonna say that without saying a heterosexual should do the exact same thing. The exact same thing. He comes first in our lives. And one of the questions that gets asked, okay, so, all right, Christian, what you just said really cut me deep and it really hurt. Because I had a marriage that ended, 
and then I found someone that's just wonderful for me, and now we've gotten married, so you're saying I committed adultery? I would push back to say, I'm not saying that. I think Jesus does. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that God, this is, this is the beauty and the grace of God. Just because that you may have committed a sin in your past does not mean that God won't do and can't do something great and profound when you surrender, when you give everything over to him. So live according to his design. And what is his design? For two to become one for life. Sex is a physical demonstration of that. And then I'm gonna answer it only because you're also asking right now. I, I can hear you. Even though I can't hear you, I can hear you. What about in the case of abuse? Well, 1 Corinthians 7 gives another, I don't, I don't, I don't like saying the word permission, but gives, a, gives guidance for another cause, another case for divorce. And that's if uh, there's a believing spouse, someone was a follower of Christ, they, 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 they weren't a follower of Christ and they became a follower of Christ, but their, their believing spouse did not join them in that. And the, the unbelieving spouse wants to separate from the marriage. They want to leave the marriage. Paul says, if they want to leave the marriage, then let them go. If they want to stay in the marriage, then stay with that person because you are helping to be a light. Be like Christ for your spouse. And so people say, well, what about in the case of abuse? Like first and foremost, if you're in that situation and your spouse is abusing you, and it happens both ways. I know predominantly happens men abusing women, but it does happen both ways. If you're in that situation and you're being abused, get to safety. If you have to call the police, call the police. Romans chapter 14, the police, the, the authorities are here for us, or at least they're supposed to be. So call the police and get to a place of safety. Second thing, you need to get to some sort of, I would argue Christian counseling, specifically I would argue for pastoral care and pastoral counseling. Because according to Matthew chapter 18, this is, there's some systematic theology that happens when you're talking about the abuse case. But according to Matthew 18, if someone is in sin, they should be confronted with their sin. If they still refuse to repent, they should be confronted with their sin with a small group of believers. If they still refuse to repent, they should be confronted with their sin by the church. If they still refuse to repent, then that person is to be regarded as an unbeliever. So in the case with an abusive spouse, if that abusive spouse refuses to repent, then they are to be regarded as an unbeliever, and by their very actions, they have departed the marriage. That's the, so not so much about heterosexuality, but I know you're probably wondering that because we're talking about divorce. But there are lots of different expressions that we have of our sexuality, even heterosexuality, that are not in alignment with God's design. And just as I preached a homosexual should live in alignment with God's design, so too should a heterosexual live in alignment with God's design. And that's going to involve, yes, denying yourself taking up your cross and following him. Deal radically with causes. All right, okay, so what if I'm, what, what if I'm gonna marry the person that I'm having sex with? Okay, that's a good question too. I, li I like these what ifs that we keep going back and forth. Thank you for sending them to me. I'm reading your minds. <laughs> sex is a physical demonstration of marriage. If you're not willing to marry the person that you are willing to have sex with, you have no business having sex with that person. Well, what if I am willing? Then get married. I'll give you three options. If you're in that situation where you're engaging in premarital sex, I can give you three different solutions. Solution number one, break up. That sounds really harsh. It sounds really radical. Is it as radical as gouging out your eye or cutting off your arm? Move out, solution number two. Well, Christian, you don't know what it's like living in Northern Virginia. Yes, I do. I have four kids living in Northern Virginia. I know what it's like. It's expensive to live here. If I move out, then I have to live in my car. Does living in your car sound more radical than cutting off your arm or gouging out your eye? Deal radically with that which causes you to stumble. Option number three, solution number three, and this is according to 1 Corinthians chapter seven, get married. And you might say, well, you know, okay, we'll get married, but we have to do all this stuff. It's all this planning. It's all, that's, 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 that's taking our 21st century Western context and saying that's what marriage is. You want to get married? It's super, super simple. Hi, my name is Christian. I am licensed in the Commonwealth of Virginia to officiate weddings. I can do it. In fact, we have several pastors on staff that can do it. And one of the things that you can do, I've done this several times, and you know what? It works and it's not weird. You can have a small, intimate, 
in the church office kind of wedding. And then after that, if you want to have the big throwdown, like let's have a great party and celebration and renew our vows and do all of that, you can. Let me tell you something right now. Your guests don't care. They're just happy to celebrate with you and get free food, okay? <laughs> well, Christian, each one of those sounds really, really extreme. They almost sound like cutting your arm off or gouging out your eye. Deal radically with anything that causes you to stumble. Deal radically with it. And so now when we're, we're going to talk about the it, I think when I read 1 Corinthians 6, there's some really great questions to ask that deal with sexual immorality that, that are really good for you understanding what are the principles behind what God wants for us, all right? First question, is it beneficial? Is it good? I think even in marriages, we have perverted the meaning of sex and we've raised it to a place of idolatry, even in marriages. Is it beneficial? Whatever, whatever the, the, the sexual desire is, is it beneficial? Is it good for you and is it good for the spouse? Is it beneficial? Will it master me? And this is where I think it happens a lot. I think sometimes we get mastered by sex and we think, oh, I need to get married so that way I can have an outlet for my sexual desires. That's because you are a slave to your sexual desires. Will it master me? We should not be mastered by anything. Nothing should have control of us other than Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Is his will what leads or is it your will? So great questions to ask dealing with sexual immorality. Is it beneficial? Will it master me? Does it please God? Does it bring glory to him? And now, well, how do I know? You have scripture. Use scripture. Go into the Bible. See what he has to say about it. Talk about it with your, with your spouse. You could send me an email. It's fine. It might take me a while to get to you, but I'd love to, to in, engage in the conversation with you. And the last question is, does it support God's work? God gave us Jesus Christ to die on a cross for my sins and for your sins, regardless of whatever sins they are, regardless of whatever orientation you have, Jesus died for you. And so if we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we have been purchased by the blood of Christ. God is for us. God has redeemed us. God has a plan for us. Does it support God's work in us? Four very hard-hitting questions that I think need to be directly, and I think they are directly applied to the practice of heterosexuality. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Slido thing and see what's come up. Um, and hopefully maybe the question got answered in the message, but if not, it's okay. And I'm just going to look at the, the first couple of uh, upvoted ones. So 24, wow. If someone is divorced and later married to someone else, is the second marriage considered illegitimate, a sin in God's eyes? That's a really, really great question. And what I would say to that, and I, I, I look, that's, that's one of, being a pastor is messy, okay? Living life is messy. And so that question got upvoted. And I understand that's a really, really good question. What I would say to that is, if that adultery has occurred, and let's be honest, I'm just using the language of Jesus here, and I know it sounds heavy, and I know it sounds harsh. If that adultery has occurred, then I think in all things we go to Christ and we surrender over to him. Okay, that's step one. And if we have surrendered over to him, and that adultery has occurred, but we have also entered into the covenant of marriage with that other person, then we need to remember God's original design for marriage. And it's not that that marriage is illegitimate. The marriage was just started by illegitimate means. But you know what? There's lots of things that I have started or lots of things that happened in my life, lots of mistakes that I have made by illegitimate means. And what happens is, though I may, the devil, the world, my flesh may have meant it for my harm, God can change it and turn it for his good. So it needs to be surrendered over to him. And it needs to be lived out understanding, yes, it didn't start the right way, but we are giving it over to God that it may finish the right way. Yielded over to him. And I know some people are going to have an issue with that. Second question, uh, are you disqualified from any type of church ministry if divorced and remarried? No. No, for the reason that I, that I just talked about. Now, if we're in a situation where uh, sin has occurred, like, for example, if, a, if, if I, let's just chuck myself into the bus. That's a lot more comfortable. Um, if I were to commit, say, adultery uh, against my wife, I absolutely should be removed from the ministry. Uh, I'm not being faithful to what Paul teaches in 1 Timothy. 
uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, where he talks about the qualifications of a pastor, the qualifications of an elder. He should be the husband of but one wife. And a lot of people read that and they think, oh, so you can't be remarried and then also be a pastor. The husband of one wife means the husband of one wife, meaning I'm not married to Stephanie and somebody else. A husband of one wife. Why? Because God's design for joining a man and a woman is for two to become one for life. Now, should that design ever be broken, be torn asunder? Just as Jesus is the perfect example, Jesus went to the cross and he took the cross, which is a symbol of, of depravity, of criminality, of shame and of guilt, and he turned the cross by his power and gr his grace to a symbol of love, forgiveness, mercy. So if I'm in a situation, yes, that, that oneness that God has designed has been torn asunder. If I can go and take that tearing, that wrongness like the cross, and I can surrender it over to the power of Christ, then that too can be a symbol of love and grace and restoration and mercy. Well, what if I'm in that situation where I'm, we divorced, it wasn't because of sexual sin, it's because we don't like each other, then I already talked about this, but I would encourage you to live in devotion to the Lord and pray and ask God, and maybe God can bring reconciliation there. And if he doesn't bring reconciliation there, you can still find everything that I talked about for a homosexual last week. You can still find the, the, the Christian identity. You can still find the Christian community. You can still find the Christian sanctity that comes from knowing and living your life for Christ and not for yourself. All right, so with that said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask the band to come up. And I'm gonna do my best to get to all of your questions. And look, I'll just, there's a lot of people out there that are way, way better than me at answering these questions. I'll put some of the resources that I found out there that you can dig into and that you can read on your own. But yourself, go to the Lord in prayer, grab a Bible, and start learning and start digging into what God wants for your life. That's what living the Christian life is all about, following Christ in everything.